my savior forever. I love that song. It's a good one. All right. This does not want to cooperate. Anything that can mess up Will miss out. Isn't that right? Matthew chapter 25. While I get this to work. There we go. Matthew chapter 25 this morning and verse 14. If you have your Bible. And we're going to look at a story here in the, the book of Matthew given by Jesus. Um, and this is another one of these parables that he uses to teach. Uh, and we've gone through many parables uh, before. And um, again, just to remind us, what is a parable, right? It's a earthly story that has a heavenly or spiritual meaning. And Jesus uses this type of... Uh, of uh, teaching uh, a lot. Jesus taught through story a lot. And uh, Jesus knew something that took us a long time to figure out. But the greatest way to teach somebody something is through story. Uh, it is the most engaging way um, to, to, to keep somebody's attention. Uh, matter of fact, I was sitting in a, uh, a speaking workshop uh, about two, three years ago. And uh, he talked about the fact that uh, if you have lost people's uh, attention when you're speaking, uh, it's shown through study that if you begin to tell a personal story, it almost always recaptures the attention of people. And Jesus does this better than anyone, I think, when he uses these stories. And there's several here in these uh, couple passages, uh, these couple chapters here in a row. And he shares this story I want us to look at this morning that I think is going to be very helpful to our lives this morning. This simply, I, I give it the title this morning of an active faith. Active faith. Begin in verse 14. If you'll follow along, I'm going to read uh, a, a few verses and we'll get into the thought this morning. It says this, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that received one went and digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. After a long time the Lord of those servants cometh, and reckoneth with them, and so he that had received five talents came and brought the other five talents, uh, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thy good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I had gained two other talents beside them. He, his Lord said unto them, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee rule over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. 
Then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I know that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there uh, hast that is thine. And his Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to put my money to the exchangers, then at coming I should have received mine own usury. Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him which hath ten talents. This is a very interesting story to me. Jesus tells a story about a man who entrusts three servants of his with different amounts of property and money and then leaves town. The first two servants double their master's money, but the last one hides his in the ground. And so therefore, when the master returns, he rewards the first two servants for their faithfulness, but he rebukes the last servant, calling him, uh, what does he say here, the slothful and wicked servant. The property entrusted to this man is taken from him and then given to the servant whom had taken five talents, uh, five and turned it into ten. And when I read this passage, I begin to realize that Jesus is sharing this story as a picture of himself leaving and leaving us to the ministry and to, to serving him until he comes back again and telling us this. That real faith leads to active obedience. We see some things in this story here uh, about these servants and the master. And let me say this, first of all, I want us to notice the picture of Christ's command. In verse 14, God, Jesus is teaching here and he knows that he, the time of his death is coming very soon. He, he's trying to teach them and prepare them and, and give them some final teachings and lessons uh, before he leaves them and, and making sure that they're prepared for life without him. And in verse 14, he starts off by saying this here. He says, For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. The irony of this story is that Jesus is doing the very thing he says in verse 14. Here is Jesus, the, the master, right? Preparing to leave this earth. He's going to die and then ascend into heaven where he is currently. And he is preparing his disciples and his followers for life without him. And he's also trying to prepare them to understand that their work is just beginning to spread the message of the gospel to the whole world. And so here he is, he's gathered them together and he's going to prepare them with what they need and give to them the ability to go out and take his work and continue it. We see the picture here that Jesus Christ calls you and I today as believers and followers of Jesus Christ, as Christians today, to go out and continue his work. We are called to help the poor and to help the sick and to minister to the hurting and the broken and the widow and the, the, those that have fallen into sin. We are called to study the word and to have a relationship with God. We are called to continue the ministry and to share the gospel with the, the people that are all around us every day. We're called to live like Jesus Christ, are we not? We're called to do what Jesus did and to live like Jesus did and to follow his teachings. And so here he is, he tells us, I am preparing to leave, I am preparing to go, and I want you to continue my ministry. He's going to give them some talents and some abilities. And let me say this this morning, that God has given each of us abilities, talents, and a calling in our life for our spiritual service. 
If you are a believer this morning, and if you have accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and sought Him and say, made that commitment to live a life for Jesus, uh, let me say then that it comes with a life of service that is required. He's asking us, He's commanding us to go forward uh, as He did the disciples here and share the gospel. Not only the picture of Christ's command, number one, but number two, the service that Christ commands. In verses 15 and 19, he gives to them, why he gives one man five, one man two, and one man one. And he tells them to go out and to be good stewards. The story tells us he's going to leave and leave for a very long time. Jesus Christ leaves and he has left us with a responsibility to fulfill his calling. We may all have different abilities and callings in the body of Christ, But we have all been called to serve in some capacity. And he sends us out to do what we are called to do and expects us to return fruit in our spiritual lives. But you know the sad truth today is some Christians don't. There are many Christians who, like the man who has five talents, returns five talents. There are many Christians who, like the man who had two talents, returns two more talents. But there are some who receive one and do nothing with it. The third servant who hid his talent in the ground had a reason for his disobedience. Isn't Isn't it interesting that when we disobey God, we usually have given ourselves a reason why it's okay. Let me ask you this. How many times when you disobey your parents when they come do you have a reason ready why you disobeyed? Yes, I do. Hmm? <laughs> now let me say this. I always thought I had a great reason as to why I didn't do what my mom asked me to do. I mean, I thought, surely she cannot get mad at this. <laughs> oh, she did. <laughs> See, we try to justify our disobedience, and that's in every aspect of our life. We try to justify when we didn't listen to our parents. We try to justify when we didn't listen to our teacher. Whatever it may be, let me say this. We try to justify when we do not listen to God. Listen, well, you know, it's not really that bad. Well, well, you know, I just can't do it. What is his excuse here? Verse 24 and verse 25. Look there with me, if you will. Verse 24 and verse 25. He says, then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I know that thou art a hard man. Already, here he is, look at this. He is trying to put the blame upon his master for as to why he didn't do anything with it. How many times have we maybe not said the words, God, it's your fault, but we thought, well, God, it's your fault. I I can't do that. God, you want me to do that? I, there's no way I can do that. He says that you are a hard man. He begins to question the character of him. He, he, he then points out, he says, well, I just know that you're just, you're just so much better than I am. And, and you're able to, 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 to uh, what does he say here at the end of verse 24? He says, uh, that thou hast not uh, reap where thou hast not sown and gather where thou hast not strawed. He said, you're able to do things that I could never do. Look at the reply, though. He begins to blame his master for his own passive and lazy disobedience, and we do the same. We may not notice it, we may not realize it, we may not intentionally do it, but we do the same. We begin to make excuses for the disabilities we have or for the the, 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 the shortcomings we have, and we say in verse 25, he says, I was afraid. I feel some Christians today have not returned on their given abilities or returned on their service or produced fruit in their spiritual life or growth in their spiritual life because they are afraid. Maybe it is they're afraid of God. Maybe it is they're afraid of of, of the people in their lives. Maybe it is they're afraid of failure. Whatever it is, they are afraid. And verse 26 gives us a very interesting response. The Lord answered unto him, and he calls him a wicked and slothful servant. But he says this, Thou knowest 
that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not stored. He says, you may not be able to do that, but I have and I can. And I have sent you in my name to do so. Therefore, you can because I have sent you. He said, you can do something because I have sent you. You know what the truth is today? And I, I, this is, if, if you get nothing else this morning, please get this. You and I can do nothing spiritually. But God can. And because God has sent us, therefore, we can as well. We cannot save anybody. I'm thankful that we've had some salvations here this year and, and we've had salvations in the past. Let me say this, that I cannot save anybody. But God can use me and God can use you to share the gospel and show somebody Jesus Christ's salvation. Can I say this, that I cannot, I cannot do anything on my own to change somebody's life. But God has sent me to tell people about somebody who can, and God does the same for you as well. We see here the service that Christ commands. He is calling us to a life of service, not because of our own abilities, but because of what he can do through us. Please understand this morning that it was not the ability of the first servant to turn five into ten, or the ability of the second servant to turn two into four. It was the ability of the master who sent them. And if the servant who had won had simply trusted his master's command, I believe this morning he would have turned it into two. We see here the service that Christ commands, and I, I wish this morning, I wish this morning that I could convey to you the importance of a life serving Christ. Because if we are Christians, and we are failing to serve God and live for him, then the truth is, do we really deserve to be called Christians? Not only, number one, the picture of Christ's command, number two, the service Christ commands, but number three, and lastly this morning, the faith that Christ desires. In verses 19 through 28, in verse 19, the master comes back and he begins to ask them, what have they done? At first, he comes to the servant who had five, in verse 20, he says, And so he that, uh, he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. And his Lord said unto him, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I want to point out something this morning. I want you to notice that one man was given five, turned it into ten, right? And one man is given two, and he turns it into four. Is one of them greater than the other? No. Matter of fact, the master gives them the exact same response, word for word. He says, well done, my good and what? Faithful servant. See, it's not about how much you do, and it's not about how many things you accomplish, and it's not about outdoing somebody across the pew. And it's not about being better than this person in the church or, or, or serving more than that person or being more recognized. It's about this, doing simply what God has called you to do. Because whether great or small this morning, if we do what God has called us to do, he will look at us and say, well done, my good and faithful 
Sir. I think we have a misconception today in churches, especially among young people, that they have to do more and more and more and more, and I've got to be better, and I've got to work harder, and I've got to serve more, and I've got to get into that ministry, and I've got to do this, and I've got to make sure everybody recognizes what I'm doing. And the sad truth today is that they failed to realize, and even adults today, please understand this, we failed to realize that it doesn't matter if you do a million things, if you fail to do the one thing that God has called you to do, you're failing in your service to Christ. Don't seek to do something that you're not equipped to do. Do what God has called you to do. This story serves as a warning to us that doing nothing can be disobedience to God as well. Sometimes Christians become so afraid because they see everybody doing all these things and they think, I can't do all that. And so then what do they do? Nothing. James chapter 4 verse 17 tells us this, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is a sin. Can I say this morning that when we know what God has called us to do and we do not do it, I believe this morning the Bible tells us very clearly that it is a sin. Knowing God's heart and character will lead us to a willingness to obey Him. A willingness to trust Him. And I say this morning that we must be willing to say, God, whatever you have asked me to do, whatever abilities you give me, and whatever calling you place upon my life, give me the strength to fulfill your will in my life. I don't know what that means, and I don't know what that is, and can I say it's different for every person. What God has called me to do is much different than what God has called you to do, and what God has called you to do is not what God has called me to do. Let me say this. I get the opportunity to be your pastor and to stand up and speak to you every week, but you get the opportunity to talk and interact with dozens and dozens of people every day in your life that I will never get to meet and speak to. And if we have an, a, a, an attitude that the gospel is only, uh, that, 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 that living for Christ is just something we do at church, or that the gospel is only to be shared by the pastor or those who are, are, are serving in ministry, we're going to have a lot of people who will never hear the gospel because we done nothing. And my warning to you is this this morning. Let us boldly Proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because can I say soon and very soon. Jesus Christ is coming back. Or you and I will one day die and stand before God. And he will ask us. What have you done? With what I have given you. And called you to do. And I sure hope this morning that I hear. That you hear. Well done my good and faithful servant. Sister Janet, would you come? Uh, and uh, but Steve, we're going to sing a song as we close out our services this morning. An act of faith. Don't let our faith be dead and silent, but boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Turn over to page 294.